When the mighty sparrow bursts yeah! on the scene in 1956, Trinidad's socio-economic conditions ensure that the young black Calypsonian is relegated to the lower rungs of reward. With his crown, he gets a $40 cash prize. Center stage focus, however, is reserved for the queen of carnival. The fact is that she was queen and I was king. And I'm saying, well, at least the king should get something on par. The king thing went to my head, quick. And I started to realize, well, what went wrong? I didn't know how much money she got or what type of prizes she had. It's afterwards, when me and my boys and them start talking, I get a cup from Angostura and um, this $40 and if anything else, it was a bit something minute. And uh, so we started now to go to the powers that be and tell them, well, look, you know, we had to treat us a little better. So we decided quite say, well, listen, fellas, we, we can't get help, you know, so we will do. We're going back and sing for this $40 and think there and look how much money she, the queen get in. Split it. Cut it in half. <laughs> and you know, they were quite substantial. I mean, yes, motor cars after a while, um, whole suites of furniture, lingerie, trips abroad, you know. Everybody seemed to be, every businessman seemed to be tripping over his uh, companion to see what more he could offer. The 21-year-old monarch is incensed, and the next year, he composes this scathing carnival boycott and refuses to defend his crown. His song galvanizes popular support that leads to the formation of a new organizing body for carnival, the state-supported Carnival Development Committee. And on Dimash Grand Night, a defiant mighty sparrow leads a breakaway cast of Calypsonians at a competing show at the Globe and takes the unofficial crown. Because it really was atrocious the way we were treated. And um, I, I got a lot of support, a lot of support from the guys who thought that we were treated unfairly. The Calypsonians and the mass men, I mean, if you added the value of their prizes together, they were far less than what the Queen God. And let the queen run the show without steel bomb and calypso. If you want to go, you could go up there, but me ain't going nowhere. Sparrow was the person who stopped the whole take a drink of rum and sing for me, sort of syndrome and calypso. He's the one who stood up and said, No, if we don't get extra, extra more money, we ain't singing. And I mean, the kind of the level that the standard of music at that period. These guys used to be arguing for about $200, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. you know, and a brass crown, you know. But, um, so he started off that sort of um, respect, the Calypsonian sort of frame of mind that, that um, had been carried through to the to a uh, sort of ridiculous state. 57 was, uh, things came to a head, partly because I think of the politics, um, the PNM's winning of the election in in uh, 56, the determination that one of the first things that was to be done was that Carnival would be wrested out of the hands of uh, those who were then in control of it. Paro is the main man who really stopped that when he, he um, boycotted the CDC and went into his own showing club. Mm -hmm. And some of the Calypsonians at that point in time who boycotted with him sneaked out of the globe and still went and Stand in the other, you know. Yeah. He was like the first Calypso trade unionist. By 1963, Sparrow makes another bold move, setting up his recording company at Salvatore Building. Sparrow's first recording there was a slave, and it was a hit. It was a monster hit, slave. And he decided to take all this money <laughs> and invest it in the other Calypsonians. One of the strangest things was that he recorded the mighty Sniper. Sniper never sang a note on a stage before that. He did a recording of this boy and he did Beavers too. All that was the money from the slave. Five years later, consumed by the quest to put the Calypsonian in charge of his destiny, he builds Sparrow's Hideaway, an entertainment and sports complex next to his home in Pitty Valley. 
it is an instant success, attracting Calypso and boxing fans, although other venues would later steal the crowds. Sparrow's defiance squares with the temper of the times. His 1956 victory had coincided with the emergence of Dr. Eric Williams, the man who would lead Trinidad and Tobago to national independence. To Williams, Sparrow is a fellow visionary with a special touch for communicating his program to the grassroots. Shortly after he got into power, um, there was a sort of a, a, a love relationship that developed. Man. I mean, we, he, he, he made me feel important. He made me feel uh, uh, to get involved. He had a way of getting to you with this way he spoke and, you know, his reputation, first of all, you're so happy to know that a black man uh, uh, have that kind of reputation, being so brilliant, and then he able not to talk over your head. You know, he would speak to you in the kind of language that you understand and you feel like, like, like family. If the people of Trinidad and Tobago would like the opposition to get everything for themselves, it is up to them. But I am putting it to you, ladies and gentlemen. It is you to supposed to stand behind me and give me all the strength that I need and give me all the full support so that I can make things better. For, you know, like kind of Fu Manchu kind of thing? But we as Calypsonians um, commenting on situation, we used to comment on things that happen overseas, things that happen, things that happen far overseas, you know, like Adolf Hitler, Adolf Hitler, uh, how you're looking at the British Empire, you planned an invasion, you must be take Great Britain for Poland, but now this and summer, they go have you on the rock of St. Helena, remember that? Believe in democracy, you'll agree with me, but if they know they didn't want to... Soon, however, Williams' style of leadership becomes fodder for Sparrow's Calypsos. They raise up on the taxi fare, no doctor, no one, why they blasted milk so dear? He said, I'm going to put back Solomon, who don't like it, complain to the commission. None of you going to tell me how to run my country. I defy any one of you to dictate for me. I am no dictator, but when I pass an order, Mr. Speaker, this matter must go no further. I have nothing more to say. <laughs> Dramatize the thing, the man didn't say all them things, you know. But it's what I thought he meant. But I know he didn't say get the hell out of here. I am the boss. What I say goes. And who backs last? I say that Solomon will be Minister of External Affairs. If you ain't like it, get to hell out of here. And down the road, in a move that would anger many fans, he would openly back a breakaway challenger, attorney Carl Hudson Phillips. First of all, I went to Dr. William and I told him after he um, came up with this undated letter of resignation. That sort of got to me and I explained, you know, how we feel, how we love him and that kind of thing, but we also love Carl. And, um, you know, my exact words were, I don't think we have the, 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 the excessive or, or, or an abundant of brain power like, like that to just cast it aside, you know. But maybe I shouldn't use those words because I tell him, you know, this country don't have that among the brain power so we could lose that. So he get mad at me, he tell me I'm a madman. <laughs> 